All right, I think I will get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Mita Mistry, and I am one of the co-organizers as part of the Boston Area Women in Bioinformatics Meetup Group. Um, so this is a first event in our uh, what we're calling the Soapbox series. Um, and so uh, what we're hoping for this series um, and upcoming events in this is, you know, giving speakers a platform to um, get up on their metaphorical soapbox and, you know, give us some uh, uh, their opinions on best practices, methodologies, uh, tools, things like that. Um, we def we did get um, a cool uh, suggestion on our meetup page about a future event, something like a lightning talk. So get, uh, you know, having a bunch of speakers come and talk about things that are important to you. So, um, you know, stay tuned. We hope to have more in this series um, in, the, in the coming year. Um, so this event is called Making a Case for Reproducible Research. Um, and this is a two-part series. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce the event um, and the two different parts, um, and then I will hand it over to our speaker for today. Um, so this, um, you know, reproducibility can be defined in many ways. This is just um, a quote taken from a paper in 2016 uh, from Science Translational Research, which is about um, what is reproducibility. And what this is really saying is that reproducibility is the backbone of good scientific research. Um, and it's super important. And obviously, all of you know that um, you're here today. Um, and I won't harp on it too much. Um, but I also have this um, comic, which I'm sure you have all seen before. And I feel like um, Julie may even have it in her slides. This is um, from the PhD comics, basically to say that um, we, you've, we've all been here before, whether it's been you know, for our own research, us coming back to a previous project that we had worked on and try to dig that up and figure things out or working with data from somebody else. Like this is something, this is a, so, a topic so incredibly relevant to all of us. Um, and so um, that's why we are holding this event. And so for the first part, um, which is today's um, session, we have invited um, Julie Goldman um, from the Harvard Medical School Countway Library. She is a research data services librarian. Um, and I know her for the past few years through the data management working group that we are both members of. Um, and she works with students and different faculty researchers um, working with them on their data management plans and advising, um, and she is all things data management. So, so we could not think of a better person um, to, to, to come join us today um, and speak. Um, and so we're super excited to have her here today. So thank you, Julie. Um, so that's part one. And then um, part two, it will be uh, coming up in two weeks where we basically, so Julie is going to lay the groundwork for us um, and then the next part is basically building on that to introduce you to some actual tools for reproducible research. And the goal here is to have more, uh, will be an interactive session with a live demonstration of some of these um, tools and specific use cases of these tools for reproducibility. Um, and so that will be um, two weeks from now, March 11th, same thing, lunch hour, a one hour session. Um, and so without further ado, I will pass it on to Julie um, to, to take it from here and impart some wisdom upon us about reproducibility. I'm just going to figure, find my mouse so I can stop the share. Let's see. There we go. All right, the floor is all yours, Julie. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mita. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Awesome, so I hope you're seeing uh, my slides for this part one. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for um, Mita and Radhika for inviting me to kick off uh, this, this series. I'm excited to be here and talking to you all about reproducibility. Um, as Mita mentioned, 
Um, I am Julie Goldman. I'm a research data services librarian for Countway Library. Um, and as a part of my job, I do offer a lot of data management training classes. Um, I think this is the third session I'm hosting this week. So um, it's, you know, I, I do a lot of, of outreach um, about these types of, of topics. And I work very closely with Mita and Radhika um, as part of our working group to develop and coordinate um, this data support training that is becoming uh, very necessary, as we will um, um, talk about today. Uh, so exactly what will I cover today? So I'm really going to focus on, like Mita said, um, setting some groundwork, focusing on the foundations uh, of reproducibility. So I'm going to define some key terms, um, provide some best practices, and introduce actually some of the tools that Mita just showed, um, but they'll help you get started um, in making your own work more reproducible. So Mita had a nice introduction and you all know and may have heard of this so-called reproducibility crisis. Uh, you know, there's some debate whether it's an actual crisis or not, um, but this term is nothing new. Uh, there, have been any, there have been many articles out there about, you know, broken science uh, for some time um, on how it um, has been found that many scientific studies are difficult or impossible to replicate or reproduce. Um, and a really popular resource to come out of this, uh, you may have heard of, is called Retraction Watch. Uh, which reports on when these articles um, become under investigation or maybe even um, are retracted. And you know, sometimes this is due to malicious or questionable research practices, uh, but in some cases it's due to reproducibility. Um, and many causes could be um, you know, underlying this, this movement, such as you know, the generation of new data in our publications is just exceeding um, you know, unprecedented rates. We're generating so much data, um, publishing faster. Um, and you, it also may be a failure on researchers to adhere to that good scientific practice um, and you know, this kind of desperation to publish or perish. Um, so there's kind of some you know, more cultural um, aspects that we really need to um, think about. Uh, they won't be addressed easily, but we definitely need to consider them when we talk about reproducibility. Uh, so what is kind of like the main problem? Uh, so basically, I believe, you know, we believe research isn't being efficiently managed or made reproducible. So much of the time, our workflows and our processes aren't in fact reproducible. Uh, the findings like our data and code and other research you know, products aren't managed efficiently. Um, and how do we know this? Um, it's just the availability of our data and then other research products is a problem. Uh, so a 2013 study examined the availability of data from 516 studies between two and 22 years old. So some new studies and some you know, relatively old ones. And the odds of data of a data set being reported as um, extant fell by 17% per year. So the older a research article gets, um, the less likely the data can actually be uh, accessed. And this is due to uh, broken emails, uh, obsolete storage devices. Um, you know, those are the main obstacles uh, to, to data sharing. And if we can't even get to the data, then there's obviously no way we could even examine it and therefore reproduce it. Uh, so I just do want to um, review some key terms. Mita already introduced us to, you know, the concept of reproducibility, but what exactly does that mean? Uh, so first, we need to talk about, you know, scientific rigor. So rigor is, you know, the strict application of the scientific method 
uh, to ensure unbiased and well-controlled experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results. So rigor is important if we want you know, that public trust for in science, uh, which may be lacking um, you know, nowadays with fake news and just the, the sheer generation of being able to put out information into the you know, stratosphere, if you will. Uh, so reproducibility, or more specifically computational reproducibility, uh, is obtaining consistent computational results using the same input data, computational steps, methods, code, and conditions for analysis. So in short, reproducibility involves using that original data and code to confirm someone else's uh, results. And then replicability is obtaining consistent results across studies aimed at answering the same scientific question, um, each of which has obtained its own data. So in contrast, replicability uh, confirms results, but um, with new data and new code um, or tools. So it's just an important distinction to make um, when talking about reproducibility. All right. So you're all here, you probably all know already about reproducibility and have struggled with, with some of these, these concepts before. Um, but I, I do wonder and invite you to consider these questions. Um, maybe you've been asked them before, but have you personally ever failed to reproduce your or someone else's uh, research? Feel free to you know, shout out or enter it into the chat pretty small group so we can keep this informal. And then if you have, you know, failed <laughs> um, at this, you know, what factors uh, contributed to you being unable to, to reproduce that work? I would say oh. I've definitely had issues running other people's code. <laughs> Um, or workflow. Sorry, somebody else was going to speak up there. No, it was me. Uh, I will say that I failed to reproduce my work. So I guess that is the 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 day where I realized that I needed to fix that. <laughs> and and that was mainly because, you know, you start doing some scripts and then okay, this is getting bigger. And then you start to organize things, but you didn't start right. So you forgot this piece of code that was making that thing that actually was important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As we like build upon our own work, we may have forgotten what we did previously. So yeah, keeping track. And I know you have all good intentions on being organized and documented from the start, but we need to just make that more, you know, more habitual. Um, in our practices to actually uh, follow through. Yeah, these are great experiences. So yeah, um, someone in the, in the chat saying no code available, updated software, we will talk about that. Yeah, any other thoughts? Random number seed. Okay. I, I have used some R functions that when you repeat them, you get different results unless you set the same random number seed. Great, so I'm not a coder, so that's a little um, outside for me, but that does, does that mean like you, uh, you need certain parameters and certain dependencies to understand to run a certain um, package? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great, we'll talk about that. I think right. also, I, I just wanna say one more thing is that sometimes code isn't, isn't clean like that that someone's passing on to someone else like in terms of like having extra um extra places where they've commented out something or like made sh yeah so that's also tricky because you don't know like is, is that commented out thing like actually needed or anyway that's that's some of the stuff i've had to deal with Great, yeah, that's really helpful. So, you know, standardizing these these practices for writing code, you know, it's it's a very you know personal thing, right? How we how we write. Um, so, yeah, there's no standardization. So, how do we know um, how people are working? 
probably can't help with that, but um, let's let's take a look at these these questions. And I like to show this just because um, this 2016 Nature article uh, surveyed 1,500 scientists from across all disciplines, and we see that this is you know a, we know this is a this is an issue. Um, so we see overwhelmingly across disciplines, people having trouble reproducing someone else's work and their own work. And I heard some of you say you've had trouble um, working with your own work. Uh, so, and then when asked about, you know, the exact factors that contribute to these issues, we again see a wide range. And some of those issues, again, they're not easy to address, um, like, uh, the the fraud or the pressure to publish, you know, these are kind of cultural practices um, that will take more time to change. Uh, but some are related to that data sharing and, and management that we, we can address. Uh, so practices like what we're reporting, uh, what we are giving other people, uh, making our data, our methods and our code uh, available, they do help facilitate reproducibility. Um, and yes, I know there's a caveat, like we can make as much available as we want, uh, but if it's not, you know, documented and commented correctly and you don't have all the, the background information, yeah, that it doesn't matter how much you share. Uh, you need to share within, um, you know, all that context. So we'll talk about that. Um, I do want to talk about why we should care about reproducibility. Uh, why are we putting so much so much emphasis on it. Um, and it's not just because, you know, we can't work with other people's work, uh, but related to data management, we are seeing more stakeholders focus on these research practices. Uh, so in 2014, PLOS was one of the first publishers to require data sharing and data availability statements within our journals. Um, and we're just seeing more and more of, um, you know, these stakeholders wanting this information uh, to be put out there. So you've already seen this awesome um, comic from, from Mita, um, but yeah, you had a rep you had you all had a personal response to this concept of reproducibility. Uh, so this comic just highlights that common issue with you don't have all of the things you need to continue or reproduce someone else's work. Um, this is not, you know, an easy process. Um, it's, it's a very painful process sometimes, right? And another way to think about reproducibility is to think selfishly. Uh, so linking all of your research related products together enables others to fully understand and reproduce your work. Um, if you make that data, if you make that data, that that code available, provide uh, the necessary documentation, um, then someone can actually find, use it, uh, and if you've um, put all of those products somewhere, um, like a repository with a nice, you know, DOI, uh, nice citation, others can actually use your work, cite it, um, and that just helps you professionally build your, uh, your space within, within, you know, the scientific community. And it has been shown um, that having citable data sets in a repository increases the traffic to your work and ultimately more citations. Um, so you should be thinking about you um, when you um, think about sharing uh, your, your work. All right, so how do we achieve reproducibility? Um, Stodden's 2013 report on reproducibility in computational and experimental mathematics called out um, these levels of reproducibility. And I find it useful to think of reproducibility living on, you know, this spectrum. Uh, from that publication or article only, that's considered rev reviewable research. Can't do much with it other than read it and can, you know, consider it. Um, to that article then that maybe includes links to executable code and data for someone to actually uh, reuse and analyze. That's kind of this gold standard for um, audible research. You can actually uh, work with it, do something with it. Um, so I do find it you know, important to remind you that when I talk about 
you know, data management and reproducibility, there are a lot of steps to make that audible research uh, happen. Uh, a lot of processes involved to get to this gold standard. Um, so we're gonna focus on, you know, integrating one or two practices into your research, make you really good at those practices, um, will make your work more reproducible and then you can only expand um, from, from there. Um, so we see that we can provide the article, um, then we would provide some good robust documentation, uh, then we provide you know, the code and the data alongside each other. Um, and then even you know, this, this biggest piece we're gonna talk a little bit about is actually providing look, an environment for someone to, to work in, uh, providing that actual environment that you worked in for someone to, to also use. Um, before we get into some solutions for achieving reproducibility, I do want to acknowledge that there are challenges behind this. So um, first we have those human challenges, right? Not providing clear documentation and, and good enough uh, uh, comments, right? Um, and also it gets back to our time and incentive. So it is a time commitment to get our data and code ready to share and then to share it. Um, there's another Stoddard report here um, that found 77% of researchers claim that they do not have time to document and clean up their code. So yes, documentation takes time. Um, and especially if you don't do it up front, you're not gonna do it later on. Um, either again, because it's a time um, you know, vacuum or uh, you can't remember what you did. So you can't actually physically document. Um, so also reproducibility is not currently really valued in our academic reward structure. Uh, therefore something that takes lots of work and time for little reward isn't very appealing. However, I do argue for you know, integrating reproducibility concepts into your work and workflow um, in order to save you that time and effort down the road. And remember what I mentioned, even if you know, the um, you know, sharing data and having reproducible work isn't, uh, you know, the, the reward isn't there right now. I think there are a lot of conversations happening um, at institutions around what that reward looks like. Uh, so if you can only demonstrate that your other work in addition to your published articles is getting uh, equal attention and equal citations, that only drives uh, that, that conversation. Um, so with human errors, yes, they're going to happen. People make mistakes and it impacts other people's research as well. Um, there's many data horror stories examples out there. Um, but one good practice is to have, you know, other people check your data and your analyses. Um, it's like having a copy editor for, for your data. So having, you know, someone who you can work with um, is always going to benefit um, you. I just want to show one quick example. Um, this very famous um, 2010 economics paper was making some wrong conclusions. Uh, the paper shows that countries with debt over 90% of their GDP had a negative growth rate. This paper was published at the same time that Greece was having an economic crisis, uh, but no one could actually reproduce the conclusions that this author had. Eventually, some researchers from UMass asked the authors for their actual, you know, data spreadsheet, and it turned out there was a mistake in one of their Excel formulas um, where, they're, where they erroneously excluded five countries from their study. So if the results were made, you know, reproducible from the beginning, this mistake would have been discovered way earlier, right? If you had made, if they had made this data available in time for publication for reviewers to review, um, this whole bad publicity would have been um, avoided. Um, and I do want to say this spreadsheet makes me cringe. There are so many bad um, tidy data principles being um, ignored here. That's you know an, a, another soapbox series series talk. All right, so another challenge we should, yeah, I know, but it's um, not, the, not the, the point of the example there. 
All right, moving on to you know, another challenge, which is those technical challenges for reproducibility. Uh, so challenges of technology affects um, reproducibility because tech changes rapidly, as we know. Um, it would require huge amount of, of effort to make um, older generations of code work uh, with, the, with the latest versions of, of tools used today. Also, reproducibility requires skills that are not often included in most curriculums, hence, you know, the, the topic of, of this series. Um, you know, this is why we see a lot of institutions and universities and even organizations like NIH are spurring up, you know, committees to address the scientific curriculum because of these gaps um, are clearly um, identified. Um, but related to that, you know, technical obsolescence or, you know, what we can call dependency hill, hell, excuse me, um, is the, the, the pit of some software libraries, inputs, algorithms, parameters uh, that, that compromise, comprise um, everything necessary to run and rerun applications and, and computational environments. So in many computational sciences, researchers have had to rely on data merely described in papers um, or second, secondary data. Um, for researchers to even you know, begin to think about sharing their experiments, they have, have to create a collection of all the steps and dependencies um, involved. And doing that manually is uh, not only a pain, but difficult and again, prone to that human error we talked about. Um, especially if you didn't plan to do it from, from the start. So this creates that, again, a huge problem in sharing and vetting our data, um, especially considering the rate of technological obsolescence. Uh, will the software library you used, you know, one month ago in an experiment, will it be replaced by a newer version? Uh, maybe your colleague in another state will, um, that just sent you something, uh, has no, they have no idea, you know, why it won't run. Um, so we need to consider um, how do we share all the, the, the technical aspects of our work um, so other people can, can actually use it. So yes, reproducibility has lots of these problems with many solutions. Um, I'd say one problem that you know, doesn't get a lot of attention, we've kind of already talked about this, um, but um, uh, just because you make something open doesn't mean it's uh, reproducible. So this study from PLOS One evaluated a popular software package um, in neuroanatomical science. Uh, the authors investigated whether or not the effects of data processing variables, uh, such as the, the software version, hardware, and, and version of OS X, actually affected the results. And they found significant differences uh, within these, these variables. OS X um, 10.5 and 10.6 actually had vastly different results. Um, so just from this example, we, we see the importance of providing that complete study environment and parameters um, so that others are able to successfully uh, reproduce the results. Uh, so kind of bottom line, getting back to how we achieve reproducibility, um, it does come down to data and project management. Uh, you can't have reproducibility without proper uh, project and data management. And um, that's kind of where I'm going to turn my attention um, next and talk about some foundations of, of data management. Um, I will pause here if anyone has any questions um, or comments. I just wanted to add to let everybody know that feel free to raise your hand um, if you want to uh, ask a question, then you can unmute yourself um, at any time or put um, questions in the chat are totally fine too. Awesome. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, feel free to interrupt at any time. So let's um, move on to talking about data management and I'll start with another definition. Um, but data management covers how data is organized, backed up, and documented. It's basically the foundation of can you or someone else find and use your data. 
Um, so if one reason for reproducibility is to allow others to examine and verify your work, it's important that it's managed in such a way that makes that actually possible. And even if you're not sharing data publicly, um, some of you have mentioned having trouble reproducing your own work. So you don't wanna lose your data, lose track of what you did. And data management happens throughout this life cycle, the image that we're seeing on the screen, um, but it has many small practices that make it um, ultimately successful. successful. Um, so here's kind of this high level research data management overview, just to get you aware of some of these interconnected processes. Um, so when planning for research data management, you need to prepare for all the data you plan to work with. You need to consider what types, formats, and amount of data you will work with. This is going to affect how things are organized, where things are stored, how you share um, and preserve. Uh, I mentioned data management as a sum of many practices. It also involves multiple people or entities. It's not just, you know, the PI, um, it's not just IT, it's not just the library. Um, there's lots of people who may be involved. So it's really good practice to identify who is carrying out specific aspects of the project um, and what data management activities they will do. Clarifying roles and responsibilities will allow for project standardization uh, and transparency in what everyone is doing. So data storage really affects the entire project. We saw it in kind of the center of our data life cycle. So you need to consider you know, um, where you will store data um, and how you will ensure that it's backed up so you don't lose anything. And then lastly, does data preservation is about how you will make your data accessible for the long term. This means you know, publishing it in a repository um, or archiving it in open formats. Um, so there are four, you know, top practices um, that I want to narrow down. So within those higher levels, we can narrow down to these actionable practices uh, for working with and managing your data. Um, so we're going to talk more about these in depth, but I'll just quickly give you a, a run through. So first, organization. How are your folders, your files being organized? Here you also need to consider, you know, quality assurance. Um, that gets back to having someone check your work. Um, and then also version control. Documentation, um, we've been mentioning that as kind of like the, the, a big piece of this. Uh, so we need the metadata to facilitate discovery, access, use, and reuse. For code and software, we want to ensure that we're providing those comments, dependencies, all of that information um, you need. You also want to be considering um, not just like overall scripts, but individual scripts associated with, you know, data analysis, but also individual tables and figures. Um, getting pretty granular in what you're sharing um, will only help. Uh, and then finally, the act of dissemination makes your data products uh, available in a repository, ideally with that DOI, a digital object identifier, uh, facilitating that discovery and, uh, uh, and citation. So let's um, break these down so you can get some you know, actionable takeaway activities that you can do. So obviously the main case for organization is that without it, you can't find or know what anything is. So data organization referred to this method of classifying and organizing data sets to make them more useful. The name and location of files should be as informative as possible on what a file contains, why it exists, and how it may relate to other files within the project. And these principles extend to all files in your project, like not just scripts, um, and are also um, linked to you know, good data management practices. I will say there's no single best way to organize your files but a key to make sure, um, a key is to make sure that the structure of your directories and the location of files are consistent, informative, and they work for you. Uh, so you wanna be consistent. So that means developing a name scheme for folders. Um, you need to stick with it and you need to share it with everyone so they can follow it. So it's 
a good idea, a good team, um, you know, activity to get together, talk about what files you group of files you want to work with, um, and then come up with a naming scheme um, for, for those files. Of course, if you could do this at the beginning, that just sets you up with this structure, you're ready to go, you can save things um, where you where you want. It's also good to embrace this kind of one folder, one project mentality. Um, I believe our studios, our projects is an exec excellent for um, encouraging, encouraging that. And that just kind of adds maybe to some standardization and communicating with others um, and you know, uh, why, you should, why you should do that. So here we're seeing a good structure of folders uh, hierarchically arranged. And we have a nice place for our scripts, our, our raw data, our results, and, and our documents. So one good thing here to point out is that we wanna always keep our raw data raw. Um, having that raw data just allows you to go back and run some more um, analyses. Um, if you don't have your raw data, uh, you, you can't really, um, you know, say you lose your anal analyzed data, you, you're kind of lost, right, um, in, in moving forward. Hey, Julie, yeah. um, any tips for naming your project folders? Yeah, so within your projects, you, you do want to be as specific as possible so that everyone can understand um, what they expect to, to find in there. And I do have, you know, good slides on file naming um, conventions that I can, can point you to. Um, but here you really want to make sure that, you know, especially you're not using like an acronym um, unless everyone understands that acronym. Um, it's also a good idea to include maybe some dates in there. And I suggest if you're going to use dates, you should use the ISO standard, um, which it, the 8601 standard, which is putting the year, month, day. Um, that just allows you to sort and find things um, easily. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of good tips for, for file naming out there. Um, Yeah, I'm happy to, to point you point you to those. Um, yeah, again, with projects, you want to be pretty, pretty specific. So you know what, what you're looking at. And of course, you don't want to get too long um, in, in your file names or else they, they become hard to hard to work with. Um, another comment on that is, is um, consider like good idea to maybe uh, not have all the projects in the same folder, but have some structure, um, just not to have maybe with time 100 folders, 22 projects, but try to have maybe only two levels of uh, um, a structure there, or that will get things uh, messy at some point. Yeah. All right, I do want to keep keep moving so I have time to get to those other three practices. But the last thing I'll say about organization um, is you really need to also consider version control. So version control is not just for your files, but for also for your project, right? Um, you can review the history of a project, um, manage future changes, and revert back if you need. Um, so I'm sure you all know Git is the most commonly um, and widely accepted version control software. And then your Git repositories can be hosted on, on GitHub. Um, and I like you know, using Git and, and GitHub because um, it actually just prompts you along the way to add comments to your changes, right? Um, so you're kind of forced to add that, that document, documentation piece um, as you go. So next let's jump to documentation. Um, and recall that we need having we need to have all of that information about a project um, in order to successfully reproduce it. Uh, so an easy win for making code more readable and reproducible um, is the use of, of comments um, and but you know liberal effective use of comments, right? Um, and, and one good principle to adhere to, I believe, is, you know, comment the why rather than the what. You know, the comment, the code is going to tell you what's being done, um, but the comment is really about, you know, that context that you need. Um, in addition to code scripts, documentation can be contained in many formats, you know, depending on what you're working with. So you could have some paper 
or electronic lab notebooks, um, or the most commonly used um, tool is, is a readme. So you should include readme files to describe the project um, to provide basic information about that project and the project files. Um, for files that cannot be commented or described easily, uh, include file-specific readmes in your folders that describe the metadata, such as contents of a file, um, sources of the contents, links to relevant papers or other data repositories, uh, such things as units of measures included in the data columns. You know, if you're getting specific at a file level readme, you get pretty specific in what your readme contains. Uh, but whatever this, you know, wherever this information lives, you want to include everything about the data. Um, you need to remember what your data is and what others need to understand what your data means. Um, I've included a really nice uh, readme file template. Uh, this template's actually from Cornell University, but I suggest it to everyone. Um, I'll make sure that that gets linked to you as well. So I'm not going to dwell too much on code and scripts because this is really what part two is going to be, be about. Um, but reproducibility is also about making sure someone else can reuse your code, right? Um, to attain the same results. So for someone else to be able to reproduce the results um, included in your report, um, you need to provide more than just the code and the data. You also need to document the exact versions of all the packages, the libraries, your software used, and potentially those operating systems, um, as well as your hardware. Uh, so, you know, programming languages typically used um, for data analysis have many libraries, many packages um, that are used, and they all have those dependencies we talked about. Um, so we could be using um, Jupyter Notebooks for people who use Python um, or Markdown for those, you know, using R. Um, so I know in the second part of this series, we'll be covering, you know, Markdown reports. So these reports really improve the ability to uh, document your work and share it with others. And then these reports, you know, we can see that we can export them in many different formats. Um, so they could be shared with others and included um, when publishing your work. So let's talk about that publication piece. There's um, a couple of things to consider here. Uh, we know that the, the publication of our code and our data is becoming um, you know, increasingly common, um, but there are really no general <laughs> um, accepted standards um, for where and how these research objects should be published. So we have some options um, available to, to us. Um, I suggest if you're, you know, there are disciplinary repositories. So if you're working with some um, specific area of research, this is where you're gonna be um, instructed to deposit your data. Um, but you could also use general repositories uh, like the Open Science Framework or Zenodo or Figshare uh, to publish your data. Um, and then of course we know software sharing, it's mostly GitHub, um, but a good idea if, um, you know, you're using, using GitHub, you should also be um, linking that with Zenodo so that you can archive um, and get a nice citation um, for, for that data. See that I'm running out of time, so I'm just skipping through my notes to see what else I need to ensure that I'm, I'm talking about um, here. Um, additionally, the terms of use is very important to include um, in order for other researchers to understand how they are permitted uh, to your work. Um, so in accordance with the reproducible research standard, it's best practice to assign um, an NI MIT license to code um, and then to data, uh, a Creative Commons Zero license. The MIT license is very permissible and attribution only. Uh, if you use GitHub, this should be very similar or familiar to you. Um, and then the public domain Creative Commons zero indicates no copyright. And this is used when sharing data uh, because research data 
specifically, you know, that raw tabular data sets and metadata is not subject to, to copyright. However, there are many levels of the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, so like Creative Commons attribution, CC BY, um, may be more appropriate when sharing like your figures and your media and your posters, um, because you do want to ensure that you get, um, you get credit for your work. Um, yeah, so combined, these features really, you know, help ensure that your um, software citation um, principles can be, can be met um, for, for many use cases. So let's wrap this up. And I, I do want to end with kind of, um, I like to present this, this, this recipe for reproducibility. And these, the practices we just went through um, really combine to create this, this recipe. So we have um, some data um, that can be, you know, formed into information. Um, and then that information is presented in, in different ways for people to consume as, as knowledge. And combining those practices with this kind of recipe um, and our definition of reproducibility, ideally anyone who has that data that we find, you know, maybe we have some, some sequences within GEO, um, we have some code um, on GitHub that we can cite through Zenodo um, or maybe some other data products on Zenodo. Um, so we have that those, those raw materials and data um, combined with um, a robust documentation, maybe it's an R markdown report, we have some nice readme files, uh, we have some methodology that's shared on protocols.io. You smush all these things together um, and then every time you can get the same output, um, like having all the information in a recipe to bake the same cake every time, uh, the details should be documented for others to reproduce your work in the same way each time. So I hope that's a good visual for you to see how these practices can add up to uh, the concept of, of reproducing um, someone's work. And I hope you can apply some of these practices to your workflow. I, I know, um, sadly, um, you can make your work as reproducibility, reproducible as, you, as possible. You could be amazing at documentation and you can still fall short. Um, so that's maybe where tools can, can come in um, related to helping with some of those human prone pro problems as well as um, some of the technical um, problems as well. So we have seen various tools and platforms can be incorporated to help you streamline and facilitate reproducibility. Um, so first consider, you know, something to help you organize your lab or your project, like the project management software, open science framework, um, maybe an ELN, use Git for version control. We talked about computational environments. Um, so some tools to help here are um, containers um, like Docker or packaging, packaging systems like RepoZip where you can just get everything into one place, provide that environment for someone to work, with, work in. Um, and then consider markdown reports for writing. Um, and then there are lots of different types of repositories for sharing not only data repositories, um, but repositories for methods, repositories for reagents, um, model organisms, you name it. There's lots of repositories out there. So I will finish my talk today with some thoughts on reproducibility and data management. So, you know, I <laughs> created this meme and while reproducibility gets a lot of attention um, and maybe this shiny new topic, uh, remember that a lot of the principles for reproducibility really overlap with managing your data. So data management does cover the entire research lifecycle, uh, which includes both how data and code are organized documented and, and shared. However, while good project data code management enables reproducibility, it doesn't guarantee it. We have that reproducibility uh, spectrum and data management is a sum of many small practices that lead to that kind of gold standard we saw. Uh, so my, my suggestion to you, uh, my advice is to really start small and ramp up 
computational um, reproducibility as you can. If, if you try to implement everything at once, you're gonna get overwhelmed, frustrated, just focus on your project, uh, regret coming to this session. Uh, so it's, it's really about um, incorporating, you know, one practice you can start with really well, get everyone on board, um, dedicate your time to it, um, and then, and then build, build on from there. Uh, so thanks again for having me today. I hope this was, you know, some new concepts for you to consider um, for your work. And um, yeah, please check out the resources that we that we have at, at Harvard um, from the, the working group. Um, we have lots of lots of resources available to, to you um, that are just open to anyone. And I'm happy to yeah take any questions or if people have any comments. Great, thank you so much, Julia. That was awesome. Um, so much helpful advice in there. Uh, yeah, so I'll open it up to the group. Um, if you have any questions, you can just feel free to unmute yourselves um, or raise your hand or put it in the chat. I have a, a, a question that I don't know if uh, that is even easy to, to answer, but I, I find myself with this uh, issue all the time when I structure the projects that way. In my case, many of the projects, um, I will use GitHub or whatever for the code, and the documentation, even for the small folds, but in the data folder, sometimes I, I happen to accumulate a little bit of bigger files. I mean, they are not like super big, but I would say that they are bigger than you will push into a repository. So I always have to end up doing some custom function or whatever to say, okay, the data will be stored in S3, in Amazon or any, in any other place. And you, and you just keep trying to manually synchronize that, but it's not great. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if that is something that uh, you have read about or something about when you have to split uh, where to store all this uh, information you have there, code, data, and all that, uh, when on, not only one platform is, is enough. Yeah, um, working with large data files is definitely um, an issue that I don't think anyone has really uh, come, to, you know, has solution for. Um, I was going to add that into my talk that, you know, when we have a solution for working with, you know, big data, um, I'm sure someone will share it with us. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't have any advice to give you because uh, I really don't know if they're um, our solutions out, out there, um, you know, it, it may come to, you have to work with certain repositories about hosting larger data files. Um, I know repositories, uh, some repositories have levels um, of what they can host, um, uh, but you usually have to have to pay right, to, to have yeah. that hosted. So the open general free repositories aren't gonna be helpful to you. Um, you'd have to actually work with one of the repositories to mm -hmm. determine what that would look like. Uh, and that's another thing I like to mention when I talk about data management plans is you need to figure out how much data you're gonna be, be working with. And if it's gonna be a lot, you need to budget for that because uh, you're probably gonna have to pay someone to host it um, even when you're just, uh, storing it short term, uh, but for the long term, that's when you need to identify a, a repository who could uh, potentially um, preserve it for you. Uh, and that's where you need to budget those those costs um, into your into your proposals. Um, I know there was some talk with NIH on you know some some cloud um, services that they were going to offer. I'm I'm not really sure where those are. Maybe someone else on this talk um, knows more about that. But I yeah. I know it's an issue and I know people are trying to solve it. Cool. Well, at least I'm not super dummy then. <laughs> I had a quick question. So from your experience, um, 
you know, would you say that you are most effective at getting people to implement these practices by going through the individual researchers or, you know, like from the top, like reaching the PI um, or the faculty members, or it has to be like a combination of both. So just thinking about people in the group that and how they would, you know, take these and implement it to the larger group. Um, yeah. yeah, great question. Um, you really, we really need to get everyone on board. So it's really about getting, getting the PI, um, and and whether that's you know, contacting PI directly to to talk about some of these these issues and and help them maybe come up with some workflows to standardize in their in their lab. Uh, we know some PIs are more open to that idea than than others. Um, you know, some labs believe they have it down, they have their workflow down, so they're, they're not open, open to changes. Um, but it could also be kind of, you know, a, a trickle up effect, a grassroots, if you will, from, you know, grad students, uh, postdocs, people working in the lab realizing this just isn't working. Uh, we need better systems in place. Um, and maybe they can, you know, take that upon themselves to uh, implement something, see how it works. And if it successfully works, then you, you know, bring it up a bit and, and try to get other people um, on board. Um, I think the, you know, especially with, as I mentioned, with, with file names, um, it's, it's a good group activity to get your team together and say, hey, we really need to organize this subgroup, subset of things, um, and then work through that activity. Um, and if that successfully, you know, makes everything more organized and everyone can agree on something, uh, then you kind of have a, a good experience to to maybe tackle some other subsets of, of uh, files within within your group. I don't know if that really answered your question, Mita, but there's some approaches for you to yeah to yeah no that does make sense yeah thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions, but if there are, uh, we are also at one o'clock. So I just want to thank you again, Julie, um, for giving that talk. Um, Great presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at part two uh, for tools for reproducibility. Thank you. Bye bye.